I didn't have a shirt on, but I had a flak jacket on. Uh, it was open, and I could look down at my chest and see that I had a, what looked like shrapnel wounds all over my chest, and I was bleeding fairly extensively, but I was still getting Corman calls, and I, I had to attend to my men. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. The American Veterans Center thanks Brilliant for supporting this video. Brilliant has thousands of interactive lessons on topics such as logic, physics, and math, all critical survival skills used on the battlefield and in life. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash American Veterans Center. When I enlisted, I was 16 years old. I had had less than stellar home life. Uh, I, I ran away from home and a friend of my mother's signed the paper stating that I was 17 so I could join the Navy. Uh, I, if you had offered me a million dollars to find Vietnam on a map, I could not have done it. Uh, I don't believe I heard of Vietnam until uh, I went into training to be a corpsman with the Marines. I had hoped that I would be on a ship and travel the world and see all the exotic ports. Uh, I asked my fellow uh, sailors what a hospital corpsman was and they assured me that there was a hospital corpsman on every ship and I said okay well that's fine I, I, I guess I'll end up on a ship and seeing the world and it didn't work out that way. I landed in Da Nang, South Vietnam uh, in the middle of 1965. The, the war had, had started to get warm and, and we were sending more and more troops over. Uh, I was not quite 18 and um, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a shock. During the first couple of years that I was there, there was a severe shortage of corpsmen. They weren't coming out of training sufficiently trained to be sent to Vietnam, according to the powers that be back in the United States. So I wandered around to a couple of other units during the first couple of years. When there were casualties, and perhaps maybe the first time you had to deal with one is, is still fresh in your mind. Um, how do you respond to that, particularly if the fighting's still happening? You just do the best you can. Uh, it, it, the first couple of times, it was very difficult for me to tell myself to get up from where I was and proceed through uh, incoming uh, fire to, to find uh, a wounded man and to deal with him while the bullets are going back and forth over my head. Going forward, we're going to be talking about the different instances where he received the Purple Heart for being wounded in action. And so, uh, Doc, let's start with the, the first one. How do you recall that? particular encounter? Well, I was, we were on a patrol. I was with a, a squad unit uh, with a couple of extra people. I believe there are 15 or 16 of, 16 of us, and uh, it was an extremely hot, dry day, and we were walking on a raised area, a berm, if you will. Uh, on one side were rice paddies, on the other side was jungle, and uh, we were spread out as we were supposed to be and all of a sudden we started taking small arms fire AK-47 you could tell it was an AK-47 that's AK-47 has a unique sound and once you've once you've heard it you know exactly what it sounds like so everyone hit the deck hit the ground and immediately I started hearing calls for corpsmen it it the gunfire kind of slowed down and I raised my head and got up into a crouch and started heading towards uh, the nearest wounded Marine. And I had gone a few steps and then uh, they started dropping, the enemy started dropping in mortars. And a mortar blew up fairly close in front of me and the next thing I knew I was laying on my back in the rice paddy. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, didn't have a shirt on, but I had a flak jacket on, uh, and uh, it was open, and I could look down at my chest and see that I had a, 
what looked like shrapnel wounds all over my chest, and I was bleeding fairly extensively, but I was still getting corpsman calls, and I, I had to attend to my men. Um, because of all the medical gear, the weight on my back, I couldn't sit up directly, so I had to turn to my side in order to get up, and which put my face and my chest into the paddy water which is quite nasty. They fertilized the rice paddies with human waste and animal waste, so it was very nasty water. <clears throat> but it did serve to wash all the blood off my chest. Uh, I got up again into a crouch, but I stayed in the rice paddy and moved closer to my wounded man and went over and started attending to my Marines. I, I had one, one Marine that was dead I had a couple of Marines with minor wounds, and I had one Marine who had uh, a gunshot in his thigh uh, uh, that wasn't that bad, but his lower leg on the other side, his calf, uh, both the bones had been broken by a bullet. So I fixed him up and immobilized the leg, <clears throat> excuse me, and then I, I tended to some more of the Marines, and the lieutenant in charge called for uh, a helicopter to medevac uh, the wounded, all of us actually, but we had to relocate a half mile or so to an area where the helicopter could come in. So we loaded up, all of us picking up wounded men, and moved over to that area, and because we had moved out from where the enemy was, gunfire stopped. A few minutes later, the helicopter came in, uh, and it was getting to be late in the afternoon, so the sun was starting to set, and um, we started loading the men onto the helicopter, and I had the final Marine uh, this was the one with the broken leg and, and the, the gunshot wound. And I had him in a, in a fireman's carry over my shoulders and started towards the helicopter. And all of a sudden, we started taking gunfire again. And I had him on my shoulders and was getting ready to hand him off to the crew chief in the helicopter. Uh, and I had one foot on the skid of the helicopter, and they started dropping in mortars again. And they dropped one fairly close to the canopy or the cockpit on the helicopter. And apparently the pilot was a, was a new guy, and he was startled so much that he took off the helicopter very rapidly. And as I said, I had one foot on the skid and I had a 200 pound Marine on my back and it threw us both back into the brush probably 20 feet away from where the helicopter had been and the helicopter was gone. We were, we were left there all alone. And he flew, the helicopter flew off into the distance uh, and the gunfire immediately stopped because the enemy hadn't seen my Marine and me thrown into the brush. So uh, my Marine was unconscious. I had uh, given him morphine to quell the pain. Uh, so I pulled him further back into the brush and, and prepared to, to wait for whatever was going to happen next. And as I said, it was, it was getting late and the sun was going down, so it was getting dark. And we were doing fine back in the brush until the morphine started wearing off on the Marine. And he started uh, making noise, moaning, what have you. And this announced to the enemy that there were people left. So they started taking pot shots at us, but they didn't know where we were, so it wasn't too bad. And pretty soon it was dark and uh, the enemy started getting a little more bold. They started uh, sending people 
people in to see who was there and what was going on. And I had to defend the, the Marine and myself. Uh, I had the Marine's rifle, an M14, and I had a shotgun that I carried, and I also had a pistol. And throughout the rest of the night, uh, they kept making forays in, sending one or two men at a time in to see who was there, what was going on, and to try to, to kill us, obviously. And um, I was forced to fight back all night. And uh, as the morning came, uh, apparently there weren't that many of them left, and they had decided that it wasn't serving them well to keep approaching my position, our position. And not too long after sunrise, the helicopter came back. And uh, as soon as it landed, I loaded my Marine on my shoulders and uh, carried him to the helicopter and put him on the helicopter. Uh, and we took off. And as we took off, the pilot sent word back that he was sorry that he had left so abruptly the previous day. He didn't know there were still people on the ground. And this was only his second or third evac flight, so he just wasn't used to all the gunfire. Uh, the second in incident, uh, we were again on a patrol and we started taking fire. And again, I had a flak jacket on uh, that was uh, un unfastened, was, was hanging open. It was uh, another terribly hot day. And we started taking small arms fire. And uh, several of my Marines were injured and, and wounded, and I was tending to their care. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, uh, I felt a, a terrible blow to my, to my left chest, my rib cage area. And uh, it knocked me down uh, into the mud. Uh, but I got up and continued taking care of my Marines. And uh, the, the enemy appeared to just turn around and run away because all of a sudden everything was, was over, no more, no more incoming, and uh, that was it. So uh, we again evacuated via helicopter and this time I didn't get left behind, uh, went back. And when we got back and we were looking at my wound, uh, apparently I had been shot by a captured American 45 caliber pistol. <clears throat> I still have the slug at home. Uh, it hit my, uh, my ribs on my left-hand side and broke uh, two or three ribs, and the bullet uh, wedged underneath the flesh on the left side of my chest, uh, outside of the ribs. Took out a, a nice portion of, of flesh uh, and broke several ribs, uh, and uh, it was just it was just laying there underneath the underneath the flesh on my left side. The doctor. The surgeon cut it out and gave it to me, and I it sits on my desk at home. Uh, and again, uh, and because of the broken ribs, it was difficult for me to move around. So uh, I got out of the field hospital within a day or two, but had to stay uh, close to camp for the next couple of weeks while the ribs healed. So uh, that, was the, that was the second in incident that I was wounded in. And now a quick message about our sponsor, Brilliant. Without support like theirs, we couldn't bring you weekly stories from our battlefield heroes. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively. If you're looking for an engaging experience to sharpen your mind and build on your problem-solving skills, Brilliant is for you. In time-sensitive scenarios, you need to be able to make the right decision with the options available, which is why we recommend their course on logic. The material in this course will help you uncover how to identify what's the truth 
based on mathematical reasoning. Brilliant has thousands of lessons with exclusive new content added monthly. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash American Veterans Center or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Are there combat rules that the enemy's not at least supposed to be shooting at you, or is that is everything considered fair game, whether they abided by those rules or not? Well, the, the enemy, uh, the Vietnamese, the, South Viet, the North Vietnamese, or the uh, Viet Cong uh, did not adhere to any rules whatsoever. Uh, the Geneva Convention states that medical personnel, combat, uh, medical personnel, corpsmen, medics, what have you, are not supposed to be uh, fired on. Uh, early in the war, about the time I first got there, we were wearing the armbands with the Red Cross on it. Uh, all that did was make us a better target. Uh, I believe the Geneva Convention states that medical personnel uh, hospital personnel, nurses, doctors, what have you, are not supposed to be fired on. However, North Vietnam did not sign the Geneva Convention, so it's a moot point. Uh, so we, we took off the armbands very quickly and uh, never wore them again. We were also supposed to be unarmed. I carried a shotgun and a pistol when I was in the field because we were likely to come face to face with the enemy, as I did in my first uh, overnight stay in the field. Well, let's move to your third uh, Purple Heart and the situation that, that led up to that. Where were you and what happened? Well, after the second one, <clears throat> there were rules that they had put in place, the American, that after a second Purple Heart, the wounded uh, soldiers, sailor, whomever, were supposed to be sent home. Uh, I was still in the field hospital when uh, the commanding officer of my unit came in to the field hospital and uh, gave me the second Purple Heart and then indicated that he had a request to make of me. And what that was is uh, that there was a severe shortage of corpsmen and they didn't have enough corpsmen to go around to all the units and there were actually units going out in the field without a corpsman and he told me that he was supposed to send me home after the second Purple Heart but he wanted to know if I would stay in country uh, and but I, I couldn't tell anyone because it would get him in a lot of trouble. And of course I agreed because I knew that we didn't have enough corpsmen uh, on the ground. And I loved my Marines. I loved taking care of my Marines and I felt that I was uh, an excellent corpsman. So I agreed with him to stay in country. Um, so, uh, a few months later, uh, I was, we were out in the field and uh, on, a, on a patrol and we had been out in the field for uh, several days and had intermittent contact with the enemy in the field and taken fire and uh, a couple of minor wounds to my Marines. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden the stuff hit the fan, a very heavy ambush. Uh, we lost uh, several men instantly. Uh, I mean, I lost them, they were killed instantly, uh, quite a few wounded. And so I tended to my Marines and, and did as best I could. And then we, we took a very heavy mortar attack. Uh, mortars seem to be my better, better noir uh, in Vietnam. And this last one uh, tore me up fairly good. I had two severe shrapnel wounds from 
from the, the mortars and uh, did an awful lot of damage to my, to my lower abdomen. Uh, and uh, so as soon as we were evacuated, this time I was evacuated with the troops and I uh, went back to a field hospital and as soon as I was able uh, to be moved, they loaded me on an aircraft and sent me back to the States. And that was pretty much the end of it. How long did it take for you to feel as close to normal as, as you could? Physically? Yeah. Um, a long time, several months. I had trouble walking, trouble standing up straight. There were so many stitches and so, much, so many things done. Uh, to me, uh, uh, some severe injuries as a result of the mortar fire. When you came home, how were you treated? Poorly, very poorly. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people, uh, even other veterans, will tell you that it's an apocryphal story that, that they were treated well. Well, good for them. I'm glad that they were. I was not. Uh, I limped into uh, the airport in San Francisco and uh, we were called every name that we could possibly be called. Uh, from baby killer to, to everything else. Of course they had no basis of fact for the baby killer or anything else, but that's what they felt that they, they had to call us. And I was spat on more than once. And um, it took quite a long time uh, after I got home to, uh, to acknowledge that I was a Vietnam veteran. I love the United States of America. It's the greatest nation on earth. And I am proud that I was able to do my part, whether it was a big part or a little part as a material, that I was able to do my part for my country. It doesn't matter what the war was, the fact that I was told, I was asked to do a job, and I was able to do that job to the best of my ability, uh, I will carry that pride with me for the rest of my life.